our session today, uh, Responsive Design, Client Execution and Management with Bootstrap 3, where we want to um, accomplish two things. Um, for one thing, we're, we're um, learning Bootstrap, introducing the Bootstrap uh, Responsive Platform uh, by Twitter. But also, a really important part of this is not just the mechanics of the markup and CSS, but it's the approach to production. And I can't tell you how important that is. And I've worked for, um, well, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, so, people just walking in, this is the bootstrap, talking about planning and execution management. My name's Eric Carlisle. Um, I've been through so many job titles, I just call myself a UI UX geek. I'm in Baltimore, Maryland. I work for a cyber threat security analysis firm, Open Glass. I'm in Baltimore. And here's just a few of my experience points over the years, just to give people have more with. So, very uh, tight agenda here. So, we're going to. Um, Execution is where we're going to get into um, bootstrap more, but I want to go into the planning. The planning today, we're going to talk about things like local first development um, and the best practices that looms. Execution, we'll get into bootstrap, we'll go over some examples of really getting started with that. Let me kind of do a poll of the right here. Uh, front end developers, engineers, or, or full stack engineers. Database administrators? Ah, there we go. Somebody can just one. All right, uh, and then management. We'll talk about uh, the workflow for uh, responsive design in general. Uh, the tooling that's just come along in the last couple of years. Really, really exciting stuff. And of course, the caveats. Uh, responsive design and bootstrap isn't, you know, it's not, it's not the best fit for every project, but um, it is for a lot. So, so, I was always told never to uh, give a presentation when you start and say, hey, Webster's Dictionary defines responsive design, but at the same time, I'm going to kind of ask that question, what, what are we being responsive to exactly? And the, when, we're, when we're at this site, that is where we get a good experience on an array of devices, right from your big 27-inch monitor right down to your mobile phone. Um, initially, we'll talk about the screen width, but lately there's been more um, technologies, there's been more opportunities, and responsive is actually just responsive to whatever you need to provide feedback for it. So, um, in 2012, we saw an explosion that was like the Black Friday and Christmas where everybody got attacked. So, that was a year that everybody was like, oh crap, I really need to make my. Uh, a response went to something neat, to something that, oh, that's what the market is, and I hate it. So, device orientation. Um, so, I have an old iPad, and a lot of the times, it's 10.4 by 768. If I have portrait mode, I will get one um, presentation. I'll flip it over to landscape, and I'll get another presentation because I'm going over the break point of some of these media query. Reddit devices. Pretty amazing. So we're talking about pixel density. Not only do we have higher resolutions, but we also have a greater concentration of pixels. And really, really, we need to have improved asset quality to really not lack on these new technologies. And of course, um, with responsive, you know, we start out with our iPhone, which is like uh, also um, was 1024 by 768. But six is now I think it's about double that. But we're going to right from that small phone right up to your 27 inch monitor HD 1020p. We're not quite up to 8K yet, but 4K actually, um, 4,000 pixels across. It's getting pretty cheap. Monitor is about 500 bucks now. It's, it's, and it's uh, glorious, but we've got a tremendous amount of variation in screen width. That's the pixel density, and, and, and how, how will we create a site for it where we're taking advantage of that much of a differential between, well, let's say, okay, and there. Um, that just kind of shows you um, full HD, that's, that's your 1020p, 
And then, you know, once again, I'm not trying to scare you with 8K, but 4K, we, we, you know, that shows the scale of the difference. And then we have the phablets, the gas phones. I'm, uh, I've got an iPhone 5 right now. I'm wondering if I'm going to get a 6 Plus, I'm wondering if I have any pants with this in pocket. Um, so, but, but, um, interesting thing about phablets is, um, well, I'll mention that in just a second. Anybody see this one yet? Yeah, so, that, 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 that one got around, you know, the Samsung, the big ones, and the, I, I like this one too. I was wondering during the shoot, the model was thinking, like, how am I going to pull this off? <laughs> this thing doesn't have dinner plate, how do I, how do I, I look cool with this thing? But I admire her, her, her modeling prowess for in doing so. So, um, I actually got a retreat this morning because I got to talk to the, uh, I guess the technical lead for weather.com. It was just kind of serendipitous because, excuse <coughs> me, I, uh, yeah, you can't really tell this is weather.com back here, but um, this is on my iPhone and I got a uh, proper device detection. And it says, I notice you're trying to, um, you've got a mobile device, which side do you want to see? Do you want to see the mobile or do you want to see the desktop presentation? I'm thinking to myself, well, the person thinking, well, usually you're going to detect the device and you're going to push to the mobile sites and then you're going to get the option for the desktop site, right? That's usually the path we're going at. But <coughs> I'm starting about to think about those phablets. I'm thinking about these medium sized mobile phones, these smaller tablets. And I'm wondering if perhaps the desktop site is becoming more of a perfect default for a phone. We actually have these ultra dense, um, ultra dense pixels, high resolution. So it, it's it's almost kind of you know are we going backwards? Are we are we remaining this mobile site? So um, so this is just to show a lot of change very recently with responsive design. And then we have the Internet of Things, and this is probably something you've heard uh, about the, the buzzword oh. a million times over and over again. <laughs> so I got the mic for recording the session, so catch me afterwards, I'll be like, hopefully the slides will, we'll talk to it. So, um, so yeah, yeah, the, uh, someone uh, got up in the morning and said, uh, this is what the world needs, and, uh, and you tweet to the world whenever um, your child is whatever. So, um, cool thing about Internet of Things, well, I mean, it's part of things, this is really only the consumer market. I, I was doing, yes. Oh, did the mic just... Okay. There. Thank you. Okay, yeah, let me know. Can't hear me, can't see it. Just throw it to me. So, this is only the consumer market. I was, I was doing some research on how Internet of Things... Um, really plays out in terms of consumer, government infrastructure, uh, business to business commercial, and consumers like, it's growing to be like 20%, but it's like most of this internet of things is government infrastructure, anything that's able to be plugged in can be on the internet. So you may be thinking to yourself like, okay, I've got this little uh, Fitbit watch, I'm not gonna make a, um, a responsive device on that, but What's the device that you're going to pair it with? Well, your phone, anything. 
Um, so another reason why responsive is just so incred incredibly pervasive. So I say to myself, responsive to what not? And, and that's it, really the case. Once, once again, it's not about screen size anymore, and there's so many different applications. Let's talk about planning a little bit. Um, so this is George Carlin. I, I miss him so much. Uh, Everyone says, focus on mobile, mobile first, go for mobile first. They are right. But not just because of the monstrous mobile market, not just because everybody has a phone, everybody has a tablet, everybody has a desktop, and you have to be ready for every experience. So <coughs> make sure everything, everybody's awake this morning. Um, guess, what, what, what percentage of web usage is mobile? Throw out a guess, anyone. I think I heard 30%, 35%, 25, 75, oh, oh, that's, wow, that's, that's well, 2014, it's about 25%. So I, I, I heard some, some really great guesses, and that really pinned it down. And that's a, that's a tremendous figure. Let me uh, ask you another one. What percentage of Internet users own a smartphone? And before I ask you this question, this was a study that was, I believe, it was a poll over 170,000 people in 32 metropolitan markets on a global basis. So this is not like the population of Earth. This is like major cities, in, uh, but it's across the globe. So what percentage of adult inter, uh, users own a cell phone? Give me guesses. What? 90, 95. Did I hear 80? 2014. You said 80, you nailed it. I heard someone say 80. So, wow. That's, I mean, uh, you know, the time of the, of the dumb phone, of the function phone, totally gone. We're, we're all uh, either on our, ta on our um, galaxies or our iPhones or whatnot. Um, what about worldwide? How many consumers? Let's say a population of Earth is about 7 billion people right now. How many out of those own a uh, smartphone? Give me a number. So out of, I'm trying to do the math here. So out of, out of 7 billion people, yeah? 3 billion. Anybody else? About 1.8 billion and estimated 2 billion by 2016. Lots and lots of people. So I'll throw out more. I mean, I'm, once again, it's like I'm saying like it's not all about the market, but <laughs> uh, it's, it's still very important. So here's a great one. In the U.S., mobile only. Tablet, cell phone, no desktop, no laptop. Percentage. Give it to me. I think I just heard 13, 5, 16. I heard 21. That's pretty close. 25. 25% 25 of, um, and that's web users. That's not internet users, but, but, but that's web. That's mobile only. So that's pretty tremendous. So you say... It, I ask myself, mobile market is, is tremendous. That's, that's the, if you're in e-commerce, if you have anything to do with revenue, that's where you want to be. But what else, as a technology worker, as an information worker, do you really need another reason? I think you do. I really think you do. And when we concentrate on the mobile first, we are really encouraging the best practices of web production in general. And I'll go into some specific details of this, but by really starting small and building upon that, we're prioritizing. And it's, it's, it's um, going, going small and starting, it's, it's, it's a compromise. It's a compromise from the desktop, so it's very hard. So there's a lot of thinking involved that goes for uh, content creation, design, development, all, all the facets of um, the production process. Um, the ones we're going to talk about right now um, content focus, maintainability, and performance. And these are the best practices I'm going to uh, concentrate on. So let's talk about content first. So um, I'm going to pose a situation. How compelling can you make a story in the duration of an elevator ride? I thought of this, wanted to write a blog post about this. When I step in an elevator and I'm checking tweets, I can maybe see like three tweets at a time on my phone, or I can check two emails. And that's about as much time as um, somebody has to compel me with their idea or their experience. So 
Ideally, you want to say the most important thing you have to say and fit it on the monitor. So that means, say your most important thing, make it short, make it powerful. Um, so, and, and the truth is, do you, do you really um, get more on a desktop? Not much. But on mobile, I mean, even like network latency, under like 200 milliseconds, sometimes they did marketing studies where, um, where like 200 millisecond latency times accounted for uh, people felt worse about the brand in general for a particular uh, commercial um, for a company. So that's amazing for me. Um, but you know, when you're, when you're talking about the elevator ride, you still no competing with Psy and the gang Psy. So um, let's talk about content focus as far as lorem ipsum is the enemy. How many use lorem ipsum? I, 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 you, you can say it if you do, because um, it is the enemy, but it sometimes is a necessity. So um, the reason I say lorem ipsum is the enemy because it's, um, it's it really it's it's dangerous to create your site when you haven't developed a content strategy. You don't have a. It's kind of like saying I need an enterprise dashboard with all kinds of data visualization. And I have no idea what I'm going to report on. So I didn't know what kind of visualizations to create, how to aggregate it. Um, that's going to, like, the whole full stack <laughs> development that's going to affect. So um, how many people have gotten a design like this? Where it's like, it's uh, very clean pockets of, you know, lots of squares. And tell me, what's going to happen here? What's that? Sorry? That's right, that's exactly right. So let's say what we were doing is we we're making an assumption on the size of the content. And, and that tends to be really dangerous. And then, oh my God, because now I have to throw it back over to design and, and we have to think through the process. We'll talk about workflow um, also. Um, mobile also, mobile first, and moving mobile towards uh, desktop and TV and uh, that, that's, that's also another thing. We have more devices like TV. We have um, not only kiosk, but uh, think about the airport, all the signs there. So often um, you have to go that big. So let's talk about progressive enhancement and graceful degradation. So anybody, uh, Webster's Dictionary defines progressive enhance, or excuse me, graceful degradation as... So what happens is you create your website, you make it big, this is your desktop site, and then you work down and you, you say, okay, now the mobile, I can't fit this on the screen, so I have to rearrange the content this way, and I've got this integration point with this other thing, and now I have to refactor my code so that, well, um, on the other side, you've got progressive enhancement, which is sort of the same, um, or excuse me, it's, it's, it's the complete opposite methodology. You're starting with your bare minimum, and then I always say that everything on top of that is gravy. You're showing your most important thing and you're working up. Not only is this uh, a content strategy, but this is, this is a tremendous thing for technological implementation and web production. Um, the, the big thing is graceful degradation, and that's, that's your mobile first, um, it, it really pushes that, is, uh, well, excuse me, <laughs> progressive enhancement. The danger in graceful degradation is that it's often more complicated than you expect it to be. You have this design, you have this tremendous amount of HTML that's, you know, you have 20 hacks in there to get it just right and just as per the design, and now you've got to like hack it eight ways from Sunday to, to get it to work on mobile. And I, I've just had all kinds of great experiences with, uh, with doing the progressive enhancement. So I talked about performance. I don't think I have to really talk about that anymore. We know the short attention spans of people. We know we're competing against uh, the performance of, of a mobile carrier. So you know, if you have whatever Verizon, Sprint, how many in this people? Uh, here's a good one. How many people in this room have a consistent signal all the time and really can depend on your phone to get like four or five bars? And if, one person, one person, like almost put their, their. Okay, so great, awesome. Stick with that. I'm going to talk to you afterwards about that. So because I want to get that. Um, you're competing, and the latency time for like you know, 4G, or it's, it's, it's just there, and you have to compete with it. Mobile is a compromise. 
you, you don't have the capability to show as much. So it's, it's, it's really, you're, you're, you, it's less convenient. So what happens is your user is, has the tendency to be frustrated. So the performance has to just gun it to make sure you've captivated the person. Let's see how much time, where are we on time? Because I don't want to go too short or too long here. So, um, so when we start at mobile, you know, it makes us increasingly more, more cognizant of how you, how you do best practices moving upwards. And I, I believe technologically, I mean, it, it, it results in cleaner code. It's a, it's a better um, production. It does have some, it, it's, it's often, I'll talk about this later, it's often a tough sell and it's kind of reverse intuitive to the way we're used to doing production. But um, this is really something that uh, we should get around. I'll talk about workflow as well. So um, performance also, I mean, you know, the, a lot of these go um, pretty common sense. Load, load only what you need, um, especially with media. Media is the big killer. Even if you have a CDN and you um, have redundancy in your media, media is the um, killer for performance. Shrink, minify, optimize. If you're using, uh, if you're using Bootstrap, um, and I'll show you this. Um, you don't have to use the whole thing, and it's awesome that way. Less expensive alternatives, uh, CSS. I've got a background gradient on my header. I can use CSS for that. I've got my logo that I have several sizes for. I'm going to make an SVG. That thing's going to be like um, 2K, hopefully, and for any size. Uh, conditional loading, just load, you know, um, Sometimes you just don't want to show content because you're, you're prioritizing content. Feature detection is great, but the big thing for me, I, I worked with e-commerce, test, test, test. And that's not only like user testing um, to, you know, checking your analytics and, and seeing things, but, but in development, it's like, holy crap, I got this two megabyte ping in my, uh, uh, in my mobile presentation. And uh, you just really have to be on top of it, check every day. Okay, enough slides. Sorry about that. Let's go to execution. And I'm going to flip out of this because... Um, so Bootstrap 3, I love it because it's quick. It's easy. Quick on-ramp. It's very simple. It's, it's very um, consistent. Works cross-browser compliant. Has huge support, huge community, tons of plugins. Uh, tons of components, and it's just very streamlined how, how you can implement it. So um, you're going to hear a misconception about Bootstrap uh, that every Bootstrap site looks the same. Some platforms like ES XTJS, and they can be, but it just depends on how much of Bootstrap you use. Like Bootstrap has classes for everything. It has classes for your text, your buttons, your form fields, your, your wells, every possible contingency. It's, it's really comprehensive, but it can look the same, and, 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 and maybe if you go to boots, uh, getbootstrap.com and take a look at uh, the examples they give, you'll, you'll see other sites and go, hey, that, that's not really too far from where they were. But, you're, but if you're decent with CSS, it's, it's really easy just to get out of that. Um, so, like I said, use as, as uh, much or as little as you need. What I'm going to show you is I'm going to go to uh, get, go to the Bootstrap site. And so, get bootstrap. And so, what I can do is I can just download all right, and that gives me the uh, uh, the, the big uh, combined CSS and also all the JavaScript components put together. Um, but here's what I can do. I, I, I've got my, they, they've made everything modular where I can pick the components, the JavaScript components that I need, all the CSS. And if I really want to, um, uh, yeah, jQuery plugins, that, that's another thing. If you're familiar with jQuery, really, really great um, integration, very easy. Um, and then also, you can customize, if you're not familiar yet with CSS preprocessors like Less and SAS, and Bootstrap can work with both if you're familiar with CSS pro processors. Um, tons and tons of variables. You can, I mean, you know, this, is, this looks very, very tedious. But you can pretty much customize anything you want to. Here's what I do: is um, when I'm setting up a Bootstrap site, 
I will go up here and I'll say toggle all and I want the grid system and I want the responsive utilities and boom, I download. Um, and that, that, that's what I want to use because I want, I want the powerful grid system but I, I'm using probably 2% of what they have to offer but that's my performance and that's what I need and that's one thing that I don't want to do because uh, uh, doing re responsive frameworks and grids like custom that 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 uh, that gets really hectic. I'm actually getting a presentation later about the Flexbox implementation that makes that easier. Shameless plug, sorry. Um, oh my goodness! All right, Ruby. I'm going to keep it in this uh, slide mode because it keeps changing resolutions on me. Um, so let's get in the mechanics of, of how responsive and bootstrap works. I, I just want to uh, just want to make sure I'm making the best use of everybody's time. Familiarity with media, media queries. That's kind of like the bread and butter of uh, responsive design. Familiarity. All right, fair, fair amount of people, but, but it's been probably about 30, 40%. So I do want to talk about it. Um, so your media queries, you've got two. <coughs> Essentially what it is, is it's a conditional statement that says, given these variables, I want to present my site this way. And it's divided into uh, two groups of variables. I have um, types, which... I can have screen, I can have print, um, speech, TV. Uh, these tend to fluctuate a lot. Like they used to have ones like embossed or braille. I think that's since been deprecated. I'm not positive what happened with that. But um, if you have a um, need accessibility in your site, this is a, uh, they, they really do have accessible types. Features. Features are extremely important. Here's where you get your dimensions of the screen. And not just like uh, how, um, how wide do they have their window at the time, but, but what is the device capable of? Here's, here's um, very important to know, here's the resolution, Here, here's that orientation. And um, <coughs> I don't have a list here, but also the pixel density. I can say if the pixel density is this much or this low, show this picture. Think about that, I've got this, I, I've got a typical screen with 72 DPI resolution. I can show my low quality JPEG, I've got uh, my uh, retina screen, I wanna show my thing that's like a 200k JPEG, but I don't want to serve that down because I'm not, uh, you know, that's that's a waste of time for a lot of people. So, colors a print thing. Um, so, shoot, can everybody see that? Okay, I'm gonna just make that. I'm trying to get all designy with my. Um, okay, maybe that's a little better. All right. Um, so example formats. So here I've got my uh, here I've got my type. The type you can do optional, but usually you want a feature in here. So um, so this is one of the Bootstrap uh, uh, media queries, where it's like, all right, this is a screen, and at the minimum width of 992 pixels, start doing this. I want you to pay attention to um, minimum width and what that means for CSS. So with mobile first, and the, the, well, this is counterintuitive to how we're traditionally used to doing things, all my default selectors in my CSS are gonna be mobile. So um, what I'm gonna do is in these media queries, I'm building the rules as everything gets bigger. So it is all about minimum width. We also, you know, we can have print where we say, if this is a monochrome printer, print this. If it's color, if uh, all kind of stuff. Um, here, here's an example of our, our retina one. If um, the pixel ratio and the min resolution, I'm not sure if these are like WC3 C3 things, these are more proprietary. You'll notice min resolution is 192 DPI. You'd be surprised how spread out retina is um, over the devices. It's not like this is exactly this. It's, it's, you know, they have all these devices where we have different variations. Um, it's more complicated. So. Change my color again. So here's a breakpoints. So, um, like I said, your, your default styles you're going to have for anything under 768 pixels wide. 
and then at 768, 992, and uh, 1200, that, and you can vary these, you can, you can customize these, but this is the typical bootstrap um, that when, when you have different um, rule sets that a media query invokes, that, that's a media breakpoint. And that's where the new uh, set of rules go. Um, so at at least 768, I start seeing this. And at um, 1200, only that point of these rules apply. Sorry for keep making these white. Like I said, that's the. If you don't have at least one thing, go not according to plan. It's not a good presentation. So um, so basic mechanics. Let's talk about uh, row column. Um, uh, excuse me, container row and column. This is the nesting where um, pr pretty much your whole body could be in a container. And that's, that's a CSS class. And the container is um, broken down into rows. And within those rows, we can say how much of the screen is allocated by a set of classes. The set of classes always starts with a column, C-O-L dash and then we're indicating the size of the screen, which means we're indicating the media breakpoint or the media query that, um, that that applies to. And here we have a count, which is the number of columns. So I'll, I'll, I'll go in that in, in just a little bit. So, you know, I said I was gonna like have enough slides and stereo you some code, but now I will. So. Oh, and I meant to mention, this is on, um, I didn't have the, uh, anybody who has uh, uh, GitHub or uses GitHub, you can download this code set um, after, the, after the presentation. I'll post up, I mean, I'll post up the URL again. And you can just, if you don't use uh, Git, you can just download as a, as a zip file. So if you'd like a copy. Um, so let's see the grid. And now we see these uh, CSS classes, and, and we see the power of 12. 12 is an awesome, so the bootstrap grid has 12 columns. Why does it have 12 columns? Well, 12 has so many divisors. It's awesome. Well, it has so many, um, I mean, you, you know, this is 12 to the power of whatever, where you can have, you have X number of divisors where you can break the screen up evenly. So I can have, um, and with this extra small, or excuse me, the XS stands for extra small. I'm going to ask you later to totally forget what I said about extra small. What that means is this just applies to everything. Um, I mean, I could, I could have just, uh, yeah, it, it, it goes right from your mobile up to whatever, because the rule starts at extra small. So I can divide it by two, divide it by three, divide it by four, divide it by six, divide it by 12. That gives us a tremendous amount of variation that we can have. So let's, um, let's see if I have. Let's see some more examples of this. Here we go. All right, so now I've got two rows, and you'll notice that everything's divisible by 12. I have nine and three, and I have six and six. Once again, I'm using that extra small, um, but up here, I have my container class. I have just some extra CSS on that. Um, I've got my row class. That is, just, that is just a horizontal division within a container. And now I have my columns, which are partitions of that horizontal division. So. Let's reload this. So now we, you know, we see how it splits up. I mean, we can go like infinite combinations. Um, one of the differences between Bootstrap 2 and Bootstrap 3, which is like awesome and convenient, is you really don't have to worry about, um, you know, is it always going to add up to 12? It just in case you have dynamic content, if you have uh, conditional content. Um, this example. I'm just doing one row. So here's my horizontal division. And you know, this, these obviously, all these columns add up to more than 12. So what happens is I get float breaks. Or, uh, so it just breaks the next line. And so 
I mean, you know, this can get, get a little bit hairy if um, if you're just using one row. Um, the, the the row tends to be more of a, an atomic division, which is a little bit yeah, it's can be a little bit more stable. But once again, you don't have to sweat it. It'll just uh, break to the next line. Let's see if I have. Um, oh yeah, and embedded rows. This is awesome. Um, So take a look at what I'm doing here. It's um, I have my row, and I'm just making one column that's 12 columns long. And within, the, oh yeah, within that I'm having I'm just embedding another 12 column. I'm making another row. You can nest rows, and I'm making one row of six and six, and one row of four, four, and four. So let's take how the, see how this looks. So here we go. Um, yeah, so I've got my 12, and you know what, I, I, oh, that's my label. I thought that was the class, shoot, okay, good, good. I thought I did code wrong for a second. All right, so, so I've, got my, um, I've got my row 12, and I broke it into two pieces of this, uh, this six columns, and then I have the other six columns, and notice how I don't have to sweat, um, it's always 12. So I don't have to say like six is two and two and two. I can just everything is twelve again. So it's it's pretty awesome. Um, let's go back to our there we go offsets. So offsets is I don't want. When you don't want something always to the left of the screen, oh, sorry, let me make a white. And how are we doing on time? What time is it? 11 away. So how much, how much more time do we have? I'm sorry. 35 minutes. All right. We're awesome. We're awesome. So my offset. So... I have something that I just want to left align, and I don't want to have a column there that just has like a non-breaking space or is just empty because that's more noise on the screen. So here I have my, um, I've got the size I want to make it, but I'm also the size I'm going to um, offset it, which means I'm just going to push it over X columns, which make, what makes this neater is it's also sensitive to your uh, media query. So, um, and then we'll get to that in just a moment, but. Uh, I can say at this size, I want the offset to be six columns over. When we get bigger, I want it four, two, one. So let's take a look at the example here. Go to offsets. And here we go. We just, we just have three that are six long. One of them, I'm the first one, I have no offset. The second one, I'm offsetting by three. That's just pushing it over three columns. And the third one, I'm pushing it over by six. So that's pretty plain. Let's let's see some different examples here. I was going to make a button that just showed you different stuff, but I actually want to go into an editor and show you code. Otherwise, things can get really dry. Okay, let's see one other, and let's see what I, I'm trying to remember what I did in this. Um, Oh yeah, multiple offsets per row. So that's that's awesome. So I don't necessarily have to do, have that one push to the left. I can say I want to use two columns. I want to push three. Then I want to use two more columns, push three again. You can see we have different combinations of this. So we're not having to fill our grid. It doesn't have to be 12 by 12 by 12 by 12 everywhere. I can just um, use as little as I need. And it's just cleaner code. Um, I don't run into uh, situations where I use offset a lot, just because I'm using the entire display, but... Um, PowerPoint, you're killing me. What's going on? There we go. Okay, pulls. Uh, floats and clears. Familiarity. All right, awesome. So, um, so a float is essentially um, 
I want to pull everything to a particular direction. So I have a div on the screen, and I have these three items that I want to force to the left side of the screen. I want these two items I want to put on the right side of the screen, and then I'm going to clear it, which means there's a new rule set after that. Uh, Bootstrap makes it really convenient because I've got these pull left and pull right um, classes that I will make visible. There we go. So I've just got this row, and I don't and notice that on this these divs I don't have any um, indication of this is a new row or this is the size I want. It's just the size it is, and I'm just going to pull it to the left and the right. Let's see that. So go back to my code. Take a look at my polls. And there we go. I've got three on pull on left, three on pull on right. Um, one thing I want you to notice about this is the orientation, or rather um, the source order in which a pull registers. So the first thing that you pull left is going to hit that left side of your um, element. The second one is going to hit that one side. So it's not exactly going to line up the way you anticipate. Sometimes you have to reverse the order. Notice that in both of these examples, um, I have one, two, three, one, two, three. So, you know, I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm going to say one, two, three twice, right? Well, um, I see this happens on the left because from left to right, the first number one is going to hit first, then two second, then three third. But on the right side, I'm, I see um, that right went all the way to the right, and now it's reverse order. So um, the visual order doesn't necessarily match the source order. <laughs> Dark points got me. Okay, here's the thing where, okay, so I said before, I want you to forget everything about extra small because you really, I mean, the tendency is you're going to make that default um, CSS selector at the top of your file that says for little screens do this. So it's, it's really rare that you're going to make a, um, you're going to make something for extra small just because the default is extra, extra small. And typically at extra small, everything collapses vertically. I mean, it doesn't always have to, and for that reason you have that option. But um, now we have, we have two different things that are going to happen here. We've got, um, we've got a classes, and I've got two sizes indicated for these. So what this means is that if I'm at a medium size, medium is 768 pixels and above, I'm going to um, I'm going to make this six columns. When I get to the large media query, that media break, um, and that's 992 pixels and above, I'm just going to make it three wide. Um, and I'll just do the opposite with this one. These both add up to 12 and I'll show you how that works. Okay, so sorry, I hope I'm not making anybody dizzy with a display. Okay, so like I said, forget anything we've we've done with uh, extra small, and let's show some resets. We just, I mean, that just were. resetting the rules at a particular media breakpoint. And the, at the, the media breakpoint is just the number of pixels where you have the different rule, and then the media query is the, uh, the set of rules that applies to that media breakpoint. I, I, I hope I'm not saying that too interchangeably where the two terms are confused together. So let's see something different. All right. So, um, <laughs> wow. Okay, so this one at a small resolution, it's 
Call small four, call medium three, call large one. Okay, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is our large, this is, um, this is 1200 and above, 1200 pixels and above. So these are only gonna take one column. This is gonna take 10. I'm gonna move these over, or I'm going to, um, actually, you know what? If you haven't used Firefox Developer Edition, it is like awesome. Um, Chrome Canary has this as well. Chrome Canary is kind of like the Developer Edition, but um, so here I've got my Developer Tools panel. And what I can do is I can have a responsive design mode where I'll go over here and I actually have the controls without having to um, resize my browser. So let's go ahead and just. Uh, this more room to see the screen, and I'll start moving this over, and boom, it snaps. Um, it snaps, and now it's medium. This takes up these two on the end, take up three. This one in the middle takes up six, and then this is going to change again. When I go to um, small, which is 768 and above, it's going to be um, four, four, and four. So notice I don't have extra small here, and so this is a div. So what does a div do um, as far as screen width? What is, what, how much width of the screen does a div try to take? Yeah, all of it. So I have indicated a rule that states otherwise, so boom, we're stacked on top of each other. Notice I'm, I'm kind of doing that with, the, um, with our navigation here. I have a, a, an unordered list that's, not, that's unformatted, and pretty much I don't, I say at the medium breakpoint, um, Let's see where I can uh, go in here. So, so right here I've got I've got my um, in my styles I have my uh, media queries that correspond with uh, the the um, the breakpoint widths of Bootstrap, and I say once it gets to 992, make the uh, list items inline block so they they line up uh, side by side. So Ruby. So, and I mean to do this more during presentations, but it, everything pretty clear so far? Everything pretty easy to follow? We okay? See some nods out there? All right, all right, groovy. Raise those hands, those, throw those questions at me. Don't be shy if uh, something comes to mind or it's like, hey, Eric, you just did not say that right. Man, I, I, I've, so. Not only can I do um, resets with, uh, with rows, but I can do it with the offsets, which is awesome too. So here I've got uh, just something that I'm pushing to the side. And actually, I'll go back to Firefox because I've got the groovy um, responsive tool. Eh, must have cached, I don't know. Um, oh, sorry, I'm just going to exit presentation mode. There we go, awesome, now I can. If anybody here uses Mac and you're um, you've upgraded to Yosemite, it's a little harder. It's a little harder to control uh, window sizing. The uh, the resize button maximizes the screen. It's kind of weird, but um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's just one more thing, right? It's like, um, but you you know, it's like I, I still haven't changed the uh, the mouse the mouse orientation to natural, so I'm I'm, I'm just stubborn. So I'm gonna I'm gonna bring this in, and you can see that the number of columns and my offset changes. Um, so that's groovy. And of course, when I get the extra small, boom, we're just, we're just across the screen. So I'm changing two things at once. So you imagine that, that can be a pretty, uh, pretty graceful way to go about that. And once again, make, just making the code as small as you, as you have to. Right now I've got a row, and I just have one div in here that has all kinds of different, different behavior for different uh, presentation size. I think I have one more.
Responsive images, okay. All right, so um, Bootstrap has a uh, utility class. That's one thing, if you're gonna take a look at Bootstrap, be sure and take a look at the utility classes. Thing like pull left, pull right, image responsive. Tons and tons of classes does wonderful things that you just wouldn't have to do in your, your CSS and so I'm going to show a couple of, here we go, here's my man. True story, true story, I was, I, I'm sorry, anecdotal. I was 14 years old, I was at a Trek convention, I, asked, I uh, answered a Trek trivia question um, for George Takai. He was just like, dude, I'm an actor. I, I, I mean, he knows his stuff about Star Trek, but uh, I'll ask everybody here. Why can't the Federation have cloaking technology? What's that? Get him records. Winner. I wish I had like t-shirts or something. This is where a t-shirt cannon would be like. Be, be proud. You have pride in the geekdom, man. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I tweeted about this the other day. It's like, I, I feel like today it's like, uh, geeks are cool, Star Trek is sexy, and Weird Al got number one on Billboard the other day. So it's like, this is like reverse high school, this world. It's wonderful. Uh, sorry? Oh. Um, so I want you to see what happens with these images. I have the same image, and admittedly this is like a big image, but what I'm going to do is, by having that responsive image class on there, it's actually going to maintain the, um, I'm, I have a different size on these divs, and what will happen is that the, um, oh my, um, the image will retain its um, aspect ratio even when I'm going fluid, not when it's just snapping. That, that, that's another thing, I don't have it in the presentation, but like if I were doing a dashboard, something full screen, and I don't want to rely on those breakpoints, you also have the option to make, um, instead of using container, you can do container fluid. And what that does is it may, it still has the same media breakpoints and rules, but it just means it doesn't snap, uh, uh, by, um, it doesn't set widths at these breakpoints, it just flows back and forth. Okay, that's what I have here. No, no, let's let's see the code. No, this is assets image Sulu for each one. So um, now what I will say is that, now, thank you, it's as if that was a great segue. So let's say, I mean, this this image, let's let's bring up this image. Let's see where we are on time. Okay, we're five minutes in. Um, that's big. That's big. And it's probably like 200K or something like that. Um, I don't want to put that on a mobile phone. Um, I mean, I'm doing it for the presentation because, you know, this is a nice quick example where I can show you that you have the flexibility of controlling. Um, oops. I'm in responsive mode, so boom, 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 boom. It can snap and accommodate and just resize. Um, <coughs> so if I have the retina display, if I have um, a, an image that would be tremendously big on a um, phone, big as in file size, I would make a media query that says, uh, when I'm at this small, load this image, load this small image. If I get bigger, load uh, this other image. And you may say to yourself, well, you know, does that mean you're loading the image multiple times? And it's like, the worst thing, I mean, like, we do this all the time, like, with web productions. We, get, we check the size, and we're saying, like, uh, and we're kind of creating this illusion that the customer is also doing this. They go to a web page, and they change the width, anticipating to see some sort of different display. And that's not the case. I mean, you're typically loading one image because they're on their phone, and they're just boom. That's my image. And hopefully, that's the small image that you've indicated in your 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 either um, small or just default um, selector or, or the media query for small. Yeah. 
Yeah, we already did uh, columns and resets. Last few minutes, I'm going to run through um, management of uh, responsive. And this goes down to, to really how a production team works on responsive design. My big point on this is that responsive design is not just a change in technology, it's a change in project approach. We have to be so, so careful not to produce a site like we did 10 years ago. Um, so no more silos. Um, you know, it, it, I always say that I want to know something about the person to the left or the right of me. So if I'm a UI, uh, excuse me, if I'm a UI developer, I want to know what's in the designer's hand on this side, and I want to know what the uh, the engineer doing the business logic is. I mean, I, I'm a full stack developer, so I'm kind of cheating, but uh, but less silos. We, we need more interdisciplinary knowledge for information workers or uh, production teams. Um, smartly iterate over the production project uh, process. Does anybody here work with Agile? Agile project methodology? Yes! Awesome. Awesome. I love Agile. I'm an Agile evangelist. Um, and so we go for iterative changes instead of, uh, that's the school, be able to go through this quickly. And then avoid premature fidelity. Premature fidelity is often kind of this, uh, um, this thing where we don't realize that we're not, we need to use Agile, but we're not actually. So let's, let's take the life cycle of a, uh, of a traditional workflow of the production of a website. We have a discovery process, we have a client where we're getting, uh, we're getting requirements. Uh, at that point, we're doing design, we're doing in, in, interactive design, graphic design, we're doing uh, user experience, we're doing um, content and information architecture. Then, um, De developing and, and and usually sometimes I've I've been at places where uh, agile blooms out of the um, the development team, but not necessarily the entire production team. And then you have deployment and support. So we, what we have to be careful about is that we draw these lines here. It's like um, I've made all the discovery and this is done. I've done all the design and this is done. So what happens? Like I was saying before, what happens when I get that wireframe with the lorem ipsum? Oh man, I have to really really um, it's a lot of recode, it's a lot of redo, it's a lot of waste of time. So, um, and it's a waterfall, which is, uh, it's a trap. It's a big trap. I love you, Admiral Akbar. Um, so stay, stay iterative. It's not easy. It's not easy because if you try to say, all right, we're going to do some discovery, some design, some development, what you do is you create uh, potentially a bureaucracy. You keep um, a groupthink where everybody can agree on one thing. Um, and and, and that at that point, you also have the risk of work injection. And suddenly, you're like, you're like halfway through your production process, and you've already blown your budget. So you just have to be really careful. It's something that requires. It's really important, but requires practice. And, and I'd um, just encourage reading about that. Um, Talk about tools a little bit. So, um, Bootstrap is uh, initially based on less. It's a. I might have asked this question before. CSS preprocessors. Do we have experience? Lovely, awesome, awesome. I love them. I love them. So it's built on less, but you can work with it with SAS as well. So pick your poison, pick your flavor, because CSS can get real big, real fast, and get unmanageable. Um, and and less in SAS, even though there's kind of a danger of inflating your CSS, which is not always the case. Um, you're keeping your CSS manageable, what, which what happens when you, you, you keep your um, CSS freehand is you keep saying like, this is my div, this is div two, this is div two temp, this is div two temp, this, or final, this time I mean it. And you can avoid a lot with there, you can keep it modular and manageable. Really exciting in the last few years, you're seeing incredible tools coming out. Or, oh, excuse me, um, automation. You, um, I've got Bower and I've got NP, NPM where I can keep up with the libraries I'm using. I can control the version. I can update the version automatically if I need to. Um, Yeoman scaffolding tool saves a lot of time. And then Grunt and Gulp um, just, just pretty much can run any of the above. And, and that includes testing, um, like Jasmine or Mocha. Um, if you have an integration uh, or a, a constant integration process where you want to make sure that you don't make breaking changes, 
Um, you can have grunt and gulp, and it's like, oops, I just, I just broke a test that I made. Or um, I just uh, got a new version of jQuery, so I need to make sure that I'm all good because now, you know, if, some, if, you're, if you're just pointing to the, the jQuery CDN, where it's just jQuery.cs, and I'm not indicating a version, that sometimes gets dangerous, so you want more visibility sometimes about the, the version you're using. So, um, okay, we're over one minute, so, so the caveats about responsive design and about bootstrap and about everything I talked about, it's, it's, it's hard to sell. You said, I mean, this is especially if it's a vice president of, of where you work, it's a customer, what do they want to see first? They want to see the big and beautiful picture. They want to see the, the full screen. They want to see the desktop. This is the, the, the glorious thing. And it's, it's, it's a hard thing to say, we want to go mobile first. So sometimes some compromise there. Also, it's contrary to the way we think. We also think in that way. Big, beautiful picture first, and then scale down from that, starting small and going big. When I talk about um, mobile first, it is a compromise because sometimes it's just too difficult. Sometimes, especially if we have like media-rich sites or, or very complicated information architectures, it's, it's tough, but shoot for it. Um, works better when you're starting from scratch. If you're, uh, it's really hard to, um, especially with Bootstrap, to shoehorn it into a site that's already using some other implementation. If you're starting from scratch, it's great, but it's not always the case. And matching user expectation, that's a tricky thing. Um, one of the um, heuristics to, um, to um, I, I forgot his name, um, heuristics of the presentation side is to always give feedback. And it's tricky when you give feedback. I was talking about my iPad that I flipped the orientation. Um, and it changes. I was actually giving um, feedback, I, or I was getting feedback I didn't expect it, so that really messes with my expectations. And of course, we're, do, we're, we're generally doing a higher cost because we're, we're not just doing a desktop site. We're doing a desktop site with a lot of conditional logic. So, <laughs> sorry. Oops, caps on. Sorry, you can see I love George's gay. All right, um, so I know we're over. If, if there are questions, I mean, we got 50 minutes. Come up here, ask me questions if you want to. A anybody want to shout something out right now? I mean, don't, don't, I mean, feel free to go like get get like a candy bar, ice cream uh, for the next session, you know, stuff like that. But anybody? Yes, sir. So you're I always had trouble figuring out how, how to approach um, defining my layout in Bootstrap when I know, uh, for example, I might know that I want the, the, the column on the right and, and, and the footer on the bottom, but I don't know if it's one in the middle, I don't know the structure of that. Is it easier to start with Bootstrap in terms of top, you know, top to right and then top to bottom, or does it matter? Uh, the question is, is, is well, let me uh, understand. So, so we're, we're thinking about orientation, you know, top to bottom, left to right. And so, with Bootstrap, we have that atomic division of horizontal space. Um, I would say to that 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 you can also you you don't have to commit your entire UI to Bootstrap. It's like if I if I want to do my header and footer and I want to change the display, cool, I can do that. But if I need to do something different, I, I, can't, I can't really see how it really fits. The bootstrap, uh, bootstrap footprint. Then, then just don't put it in a container. Put it in a div and style it however you want to. Um, I hope I answered your question on that. I'm using bootstrap. Is it is it easier to do the picture or, or to come up with a layout in that order, from left to right, top to bottom, or, or in your experience is even that? Yes, yes, it is. Yeah, so question was, is it easier in thinking in terms of left and right and top to bottom? And yes, it is. Um, it's not the case in Flexbox. Um, that's two sessions, that's not this next session, but the other one, I have another session where I'm talking about Flexbox where you can design a site from both vertically and horizontally on a multi-axis. So 
I'll actually, actually show you that if, if, at some point if you want to, or, or I'll, I'll I'll post up the the, the slide deck. I want to be like go to my presentation. So, yeah. so all right. Well, people are gonna thank you very much for coming out. Everybody's excited about the uh, the conference. I'm having tons of fun. So um, thanks so much. <laughs>